Hello. 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 This is Extreme Orange. To the Extreme Exchange. Today I'm joined with my good friends from Primary School. Yeah. Friends of Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Extreme Exchange. Today I have with me a very special guest. His name is Reverend Jasper. Say hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. So, Reverend Jasper is currently a pastor at Teluk Area Chinese Methodist Church, which is also the church that I currently attend. He was ordained as a deacon of the Methodist Church in Singapore in 2020, just last year, and obtained the Master of Divinity in Trinity Theological College. I'm pleased to have you on. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. One of the things I wanted to lead into, and this, this leads very, very nicely into it, mm. is the, the seemingly contrasting nature of, of God. Um, like, when, because I've been reading a lot of the, the Old Testament lately, um, and I, I actually, uh, but I, read through, I read through Genesis, Exodus, or the first, the first six books of the Bible, mm. um, and, well, there is a lot of, violence that goes on uh, and, and yeah I mean there's there's no point in hiding it is that, mm. that there really is quite a lot of brutal stuff that goes on in the Old Testament and and God sometimes seems like this this um, oh, his, his hand is weighs very heavily upon people at times mm. um, and then suddenly when we cross over to the New Testament um, this Jesus is preaching all about uh God being full of mercy and love and kindness uh, and forgiveness, that kind of thing. And I mean, on the onset, it just seems very, uh, it seems too contrasting to, to, to believe. So uh, I was wondering what, what do you have? Uh, like, what, 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 how do you reconcile the two things? Mm. Um, to, to, to even speak of reconciling the two, um, means that they are conflicting uh, in the first place, right? Mm. So I think um, a, a faithful historical reading of scripture uh, alone will help us see that, they, that, that, there's, no, that, that there's no conflict um, in this, that the Old Testament God of, of wrath and New Testament God of, of love and grace is a fairy tale idea. Hmm. Right? It simply doesn't exist. Um, let me give you some straight examples. Um, it, you know, one of the most powerfully descriptive um, passages of God comes from Exodus, you know, kind of like um, when God revealed himself to Moses, right? He yeah. said, you know, I am uh, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love, hmm. right? Uh, kind of God's self-revelation. Um, and it is out of that same revelation that the covenantal name of God, uh, the I am name of God, mm. uh, has been anchored and, and kind of burned into the consciousness of the Jewish people. So um, his own self-revelation um, is, is, is one that um, is tied to the language um, that we are so familiar with uh, when it comes to the New Testament. And at the same time in the New Testament, I think if you read Paul's letter right to the Romans, of the first chapter, he says God's wrath is poured out upon this world, right? Um, even if people did not know the special revelation of Jesus, God's character of goodness is sufficiently revealed in general revelation. Mm. And therefore, nobody is free from the judgment and the wrath of God. And this is a New Testament text. Mm. Romans 1 begins with great gravity, mm. right? So um, as we put on um, the lens that there is consistency between the God of the Old Testament and God of the New Testament, I think some of these things will naturally pop up. Mm. And that has always been the church's way of reading scripture. Now, as I speak of uh, kind of um, um, church, <laughs> church history, right? I mean, th this is my area of interest. Um, there is a second century bishop by the name of Marcion, right? And he grappled with precisely this problem, right? It was kind of in all good intention. Um, he wanted to be faithful to the faith and, and, and the, 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 the movement of Jesus Christ. Um, he, he, he received um, the gospel, 
Um, and he was himself, I think, uh, the son of an important clergyman. Right? His name is Marcian. Marcian, right? Second century guy. Um, he, he, he was influential during um, that, that period where the Eastern Church, um, what, what would eventually become the Eastern Church, um, um, was, was, was at, right? And he, he, his influence was so extensive that his church uh, would become bigger than uh, the other churches, the other churches that eventually became an anchored orthodoxy. So in other words, Marcion's church was bigger, but that time they didn't know. But eventually, in retrospect, they would see that his movement was a heretical movement. And what was the heresy of Marcion? The heresy of Marcion was to force dualism into a, in, into a God that is un, united, that is one. Hmm. Right? And so he struggled with this same question. The Old Testament God, so angry, you know, this is genocide and, and kind of capricious, um, just keep killing when whenever he feels like it. And the yeah. New Testament God is like this God, you know, this nice shepherd with a, you know, um, you know, kind of soft and cuddly and uh, always speaking of love. And so he 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 taught that the God of the Old Testament is not the Father of the New Testament. All right, and so the Father in the New Testament had sent Jesus to reveal who the real God is, and it is not the angry God of the Old Testament. And so what Marcion did was he collected the scripture of God's people and he curated it, right? He curated it. He sliced away um, the Old Testament. He sliced away some parts of um, the Pauline epistles, right? He left about 10 letters, but heavily edited. Um, and he included an edited version of Luke's gospel, right? Because mm. Jesus in Luke's gospel sometimes says, you know, some not so nice things, right? Mm. And so he edited all these things out and he created the first canon. He called it the Apostolicon, right? That was the first Bible, the first canon, the first Bible. Mm. And it was in response to that, that the, the, the council of bishops um, of the churches of that time came together and they had to hammer out what they thought was the true canon, right? The true collection of books, uh, of scrolls and scripture, that accurately carried the, 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 the apostolic faith. Hmm. And out of that came the Bible that we know today. All right. All right? So what I'm saying is this, that if we learn from the history of the church and we learn that um, some of these, the, these struggles when, are not new struggles, then we, 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 can, we can go back um, to the wisdom of our forefathers and to learn from them how best to, to assume a stance. And together with that stance, it will give us a lens through which we read scripture again. And by God's grace, um, the ambiguity fades away and we get a clearer picture. So let me give you an example, right? In the Old Testament, we are familiar with the slave laws, right? Mm. If, you, you know, if, you, if, you, if you get a slave from your Hebrew brothers, you, you can... You know, take him for seven years. Um, all of his his property belongs to you. If you give birth to some children during those seven years, the children are your property, mm. right? Now, something like that would not float in today's yeah, time and age, right? Um, and so, when we look at the, the God of the Old Testament who gave these slave laws, we say, what kind of God is this, mm. right? I mean, he he kind of doesn't treasure uh, all human life, or you know, he plays favorites with some people and others. And then if you're not one of his favorites, you kind of you'll rain down fire to destroy you uh, at will. You know? um, but really, if you if, if we if we put on that lens, that all of scripture reveals that same God that's balanced in kind of love and justice, holiness and mercy, then when we reread that scripture again, the first question we, we, we spoke about in our conversation, how, how should we read scripture in context, right? In context, we've mm. got to kind of be, use, use all of our modern tools um, and, and read it together with, with the historical church. We come to see that during that period, slave laws were not as liberal as the slave laws of um, the Jewish people, right? The slave laws of that period um, was, was, was kind of like, 
at least two or three times more terrible. And we know that because um, um, th there's this archaeological finding called the Code of Hammurabi. Code of Hammurabi. So essentially, it is the Leviticus and Deuteronomy of the Babylonian people then. Right? It's the oh. equivalent of our Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Okay. And so as we recorded in, in, our, in our Old Testament scripture, laws on slavery, they also had laws on slavery. And if you compare that, you would see the love of God that is countercultural in the ancient Near East. Mm. So the Code of Hammurabi says that um, if, if, let's say, for example, um, um, a man, um, yeah, let me think, um, if, 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 if a person in society um, becomes in debt, right, mm -hmm. uh, kind of we owe a lot of money, um, one can sell the wife, sell the son, sell the daughter into slavery, right? In Deuteronomy, this was not allowed. You can, God doesn't allow this practice, but you can sell yourself into slavery, all right? Mm -hmm. And um, let's say... Um, if you if you lose a property, right? If you lose a property, let's say um, you lose some 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 sheep, some some flock, right? The code of Hammurabi says, if you find it, you keep it, lah. It's good one, right? Because it doesn't belong to anyone. You found it by the roadside. But Deuteronomy says that if you if you find something, you are the custodian of it until you can find um, the owner, hmm. and then you can return it to him, for example, right? I think the Deuteronomy 21, 22, around there. Yeah, not, not too sure. Um, more examples, right? For example, um, if, if, oh yeah, so for example, in, in, in Exodus, um, the Hebrew person can, can become a slave, I say, right? You can sell themselves into slavery. Yeah. Um, but as the law quotes evolved, right, through Leviticus and again in Deuteronomy, when God's people, it was kind of past a few hundred years, right, when they were at the brink of the promised land, about to enter it, right, after wandering for 40 years, Moses reiterated the laws for their living in the new land. And by then, of course, the laws of the nations would have evolved also, right, would have changed also. And so we see certain evolution in the laws of God within uh, the first five books, the Torah itself. So previously, your Hebrew person could sell himself into slavery, mm. right? Um, but as we move to Deuteronomy, the Hebrew person cannot, right? The slaves are only Gentile people, for example, mm. right? And, and, and I, a concept like that, um, again, would be countercultural to the dominant culture of the time. Mm. And it is in laws that are very critical, you know, very um, demeaning, sometimes even dehumanizing ideas that we find in Old Testament laws. If you put it in the context of the nations at the time, they were liberating laws. Mm. They were liberating laws. They were laws. In fact, the Old Testament laws gave more protection to women than any of the laws in the ancient Near East. For example, um, if, if, if the slave married a woman, right, that woman would then become the property of the master. We say, hey, what kind of nonsense is this, right? The woman is an independent, um, you know, uh, she has a, a equal rights, yeah. right? But we must remember that during that time, if you married a slave, the woman, if she didn't belong to the master, she belonged to nobody. And therefore, she had no, no household to represent her and she had no rights in society. Right, but uh, by, by allowing the slave who married a woman uh, to bring that woman under the household of the master, that gave her speaking and representation rights within society mm. itself. All right? So, so as, we look at, as we look at God in the Old Testament through um, contextual lens, many of the, the, you know, the, the, the gracious, merciful, loving aspects of God will come forth. Um, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed the episode of the Extreme Exchange. Um, I certainly learned a lot from it. Um, yeah, I hope to see you in the next episode. Um, yeah, stay tuned. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.